This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. This is Everything Elite, presented by my bookie, the world's best podcast devoted exclusively to all elite wrestling and the elite extended universe. I'm Aaron Bentley. I'm joined, as always, by my good friend, Nate, a.k.a. Epitasis. What's up, Nate? Hello, Aaron. Hello, listeners, world. A um, lot going on. A lot of, lot of releases, a lot of new things occurring today i am pretty fried from work i will be it's a friday we're recording this on a friday so if you listen to this on saturday we recorded it yesterday uh, i will be brewing a fresh pot uh fresh fucking pot at some point during this show uh so i can power up and get through this and play some captain Tsubasa and watch bill and ted later what's going on with you uh not much um don't really have anything exciting. I mean, we've been talking about the uh, the new Blackpink X Selena Gomez ice cream song. So let's, I think the listeners want your official take on the song and the video. Uh, so I was, I was pretty disappointed by the song on my first listen. As the day has continued today, the beat is stuck in my head. And it's a pretty sparse beat, which is kind of not what i got into and started enjoying black pink for like they had big like maximal kind of dubby beats on a lot of their old stuff um but the beat has crawled its way into my head and i'm stuck on it so i'm enjoying that and it's kind of a uniquely structured song and that there's not a strong chorus uh it's like almost a rap song except you know uh uh, two-thirds of the vocals are sung instead so i kind of find it interesting in that way how uh not poppy it is for such a super pop presented single. Does that make sense? It does. It very much does. Uh, you're right that there's not really an earworm in it as far as like a line that you keep coming back to. I think that's true. I, I'm more into the the, the hip hop er stuff that, that they do. So how you like that was up my alley. Uh, this, not as much, but I did go back and listen to it again today. So I, I do have some interest in it. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I, I know I'm. Gonna, I'm not going to convince myself to like it, sure. um, one way or the other. Uh, but you know, I'd probably put it at third currently of their 2020 releases. Uh, probably how you like that, then Sour Candy, then this. But you know, we got we got a full featured music video. Can't complain too much. That's true. That's fair. All right. Well, sound off your black pink takes uh, in the comments. Also joined by mike spears what's up mike hey y'all it's your old pal iron mike spears uh we were talking in discord last night about dumb injuries and i managed to suffer one today and it's a really dumb <laughs> one to, just so you could hold to the camera if you could see how how oh. mangled up my <sighs> right arm is uh, he's got he's got a band-aid folks well it's a band-aid and if it was for the fact of how pale i am i have like a i have like this huge script because i managed to fall from my second to my last stair grabbing lunch today bust my ass like i imagine that there's like going to be a a, a, a tailbone bu- bruise and then like manage to scrape my arm on the runner down there so mm. I, i'm just being really clumsy today i'm right now just anticipating me somehow like falling out of the chair halfway through the show so it, if we hear a loud thud you all know that i've done something really dumb so that, that that's all that's up f- with me uh i'm personally excited because we got the new kda track today KDA, of course, the Vocaloid group that is based off of League of Legends with uh, two members of G-Idol in it. They've changed out the non-K-pop stars this time. So it's, it's going to oh, be interesting. They? Yeah, the, the, and they're going to do a full-on KDA album later this year. And that makes but, me think that... Oh, go it's ahead. Not, it's not technically Vocaloid, right? Not to be a, 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 a pedant here. No, no, no. It's not the AI performing it. It's not the... Uh, 
it, what they what it's it right. is it's more like more like gorillas than uh hatsune miku exactly so it's more like a gorilla it is the world's only gorillas like k-pop group that's also tangentially connected to league of legends so beautiful we're probably we're probably gonna get some insane performance at worlds this year that i'm kind of stoked for they had a crazy one when it was in Incheon two years ago so i'm looking forward to see what they might do this year because there might actually be crowds at worlds just like there were crowds at this week's uh all elite dynamite I've been getting into the uh, the Christian emo of my youth the past few days. <laughs> Did you just go into hard left from what Nate and I have been talking about? <laughs> uh, so I've been making, for the past several months, I've been making an emo playlist that will end all emo playlists. Mm. Um, it, it was inspired by the, uh, the Vulture 100 Greatest Emo Songs playlist. I don't know if you guys caught this when it came no. out. Yes, I, yes, I didn't. I got very mad. You're right. So I started from that. And then I was like, but no, I'm going to make a playlist with all the great emo songs. And I've just gotten, I was recently, I was like, okay, I need to go to uh, the, the band that started this was I need to go to the Juliana Theory, if that means anything to anyone. Uh, no. Mike's, Mike's not in his head. Oh, yeah, so, I know Juliana Theory. I yeah. kind of went from Juliana Theory and I just, I like to do the gimmick on Spotify where you click like, you know, related artists, and I just went down a rabbit hole, folks. And oh, where, uh, where'd you end up at within three clicks? Uh, let's see. I, I was listening to some uh, noise ratchet. Okay, that's above my head. You, you finally found. It took you one one thing I've been Juliana <laughs> theory, but you found something too obscure for me. Noise ratchet. Uh, wild band, wild history. Uh, yeah. So there was some. There was a noise ratchet. Some keepsake. Um, I mean, everybody knows this. There was some further seems forever. So, I mean, that's, uh, that's yeah, the guy from dashboard. Right. Where that was. Pete yeah. Chris Kareba hours. Yeah. She was, uh, further seems forever. So yeah, I have so, been, I have been in, in the metal department listening to, uh, a little bit of X Japan across Japan. Um, right. Yeah. The, you know, they're sort of like glam tinged giant metal act yeah uh, and then great. randomly on my release radar today uh yoshiki who was the you know leader of that metal band uh did a collaboration with saint vincent where they did that their song sense. new york and he just uh like scored some strings and piano on it and they put it out as a new version which was uh kind of remarkable yeah x japan which is the first huge visual k act so uh, somehow I'm I don't know how me of all people on the bridge between the two music tastes here this week that never happens usually I'm listening to like sleep or high on fire so weird weird music day for us I'd say well shouts uh you know I had some conversations with Drake who's a, a patron so shouts to all my Christian emo heads out there uh yes the only Christian uh only, only Christian music act I remember is Toby Mac <laughs> yeah there was just Mike, like do you know any toby mac i actually yeah I, I know dc talk i know about the jesus freaks out there oh, yeah. <laughs> As, yeah. I, I i did really enjoy this this is complete tangent here uh jerry Falwell jr right. when well he we're was, not on any tangents here mike so right right yeah so jerry Falwell jr when he resigned from liberty university quoted martin luther king and there's a pretty <laughs> strong theory yeah. That the only reason he knows that is because when he was at Liberty as an undergraduate or at the law school, whatever, the first ever DC Talk uh, performance was in Jerry Falwell Sr.'s backyard. And one of their big albums did use a lot of like MLK sound drops. So there's a big belief here that, that the only way that he knows about it is through DC Talk. So, yes, I do know about Toby Mac. Should we start calling our fans Jesus Freaks with the double E? <laughs> uh no <laughs> no no it's not bad it's not it, it, in you know in the panoply of your puns it's not among the worst i kind of like it a little bit but uh, i think real ee podheads uh which is yeah. what we've been calling the fans is yeah. right uh so unwieldy and stupid that i like it <laughs> it's it's definitely it's stuck in there uh people recognize the phrase i think all right well I hope my bookie is in, is enjoying this episode of Everything Elite. Uh, if you want to tell us about the music of your youth, you can hit us up at Everything AEW. 
I'm at Aaron like the car. Nate, is that a Pittacist? Mike, is that Fuji? Hey, uh, subscribe to the podcast. If you use the Apple Podcast app, give us a five-star rating. Give us a review. And if you want to support the show, you can do so at patreon.com slash everything elite. We'll talk about that more later. Here's what we're going to talk about on this show. We're going to play elite or delete. We're going to run down everything that happened on Thursday night's Dynamite. We'll talk about the ratings, which are already out. And we will talk a little bit about what's going to be on Dynamite next week. And I imagine throughout this, we'll be looking ahead to All Out, uh, which is coming up in not that long, like a week. Not a week, but a little less than a week. I mean, a little more than a week. Bad at math. Eight days. Eight days. Eight days. Eight days. Okay. One Beatles week. (laughs) Sure. All right. Well, let's get it started as we like to with Elite or Delete. Delete. Elite. Delete. Elite. Delete. Elite. 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 Delete. Elite. Delete. 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 Nate, buddy, what was your. You know, a lot of people could be their first time listening. So the idea here is I want you to tell me your favorite thing from the show this week. So what you got? Uh, maybe a little bit of a swerve here. Again, based on the, the document here, which you put together. My favorite thing, I think by far, on this show, I thought it was a pretty solid all-around show. The main event segment, beginning with the Matt Hardy versus Sammy Guevara match, uh, I thought this match was... And and maybe this was influenced by my ability to see the full match on Fight TV. I didn't have a lot of the biggest bumps in the match uh, reserved to the picture-in-picture, picture, which I think is what happened with the TNT broadcast. Uh, but totally wild match, some giant bumps, some awesome blood. Uh, one of the few matches on the show where I thought going to all this trouble of having fans in the building actually really enhanced the match because the fans got up for this main event and uh, really heated it up. Um you know, Matt Hardy playing that he got, you know, concussed or not knocked loopy here that led right to the finish. I thought he did a really strong job of that. And uh, Sammy Guevara puts him to the table. Right guy wins at the end. Um, so, you know, he gets uh, some credibility there beating a, you know, a really, you know, a, a top star of his generation and a guy that AEW has been confident enough to put in big singles matches in this promotion. And then to cap it off, a super well shot and fun run in from Orange Cassidy into Chris Jericho, where while we're looking at Sammy Guevara's bloodied face, we just see Orange Cassidy zipping by in the background, sprinting faster than anyone's ever sprinted in the history of wrestling. Uh, and then presumably dives into Chris Jericho and knocking the whole damn set over. Uh, it really felt like the main event and this run in both had that real raw feeling that you want from wrestling sometimes where if everything feels a little bit out of control and it feels crazy uh, and it's fun for that reason. I was not lucky to have the fight feed, so I'm massively down on the main event comparison. I know that AB kind of felt similar about this. It was something that this show, and I feel like it's something that I'll get into in the elite portion, that doing so much in the picture in picture and when you have like audio from a commercial break being played, even though there was like one moment where I felt like they actually mixed in a uh, table break for like one of the missed tabled opportunities. And that was kind of like an abrupt thing, but it was just really hard for me to focus on this main event. I felt like that. And and it might've come out that it seemed like this show was kind of rushed at the end of it. So it felt like this main event got cut for time in this, but I did really like how orange Cassie just you, and you see him like in the background sprinting and then just doing like what a great layout tackle of Chris Jericho, just knocking over the ba- the uh, background and just was like that. I thought like that, that was a really effective way Uh the match itself. Uh, maybe it's that WWE and American wrestling in general has really not done very many good table matches, but uh, I came into this match somewhat down and then, when you had like the misfire table breaks, like they had to, it, they did a good job of covering for it. But it was one of those things that you're still like working out people's conditioning. Like people are conditioned that if there's a bad, if there's any table breaks, that's the end of the match because there was dumb table break spots in WWE for so long. So that kind of put me off there. I, I get how if you were able to see the entire thing without any distractions and without having a Burger King ad pop up on the screen, you would be able to get the more full experience. I do think that it does show 
a level of confidence for Sammy, especially given his last like two months. And then also it does make me wonder, like if this is the blow off, I still feel a little frustrated. I do feel like that this does seem like it's not, it, it seems kind of underwhelming. And I would hope that especially given what we know about the all out card that they would find some way to maybe they don't have a big plunder match happening on the show that it does seem pretty logical to go to some variant of a tables, liars and chairs match. And I'm hoping that that still is the end game here and that this was not the end game for this feud. Yeah. I didn't have a problem with the match. I just don't understand why it existed or happened. Uh, I think you had a great build for this program and you want to blow it off in a big way. You had a chance to like, you had something that should have been like the second match on the pay-per-view and then they exploded it when the, when uh, we got the Matt Hardy blood angle to where it became a match that could be more important. And obviously the point of these angles and they might do further ones is for Matt Hardy to put people over. So, I mean, obviously Sammy Guevara is going to win this, this feud. He should. But to just do it in like an eight minute table match on Dynamite seems very bizarre to me. You... I, I disagree now, Mike. I used to think, yeah, okay, we'll do this tables match. Then we'll do the TLC match at the pay-per-view. But now Sammy's already won. There's no point in doing a bigger escalation at the pay-per-view. The feud is over from my perspective. And so that's why I really did not like this overall. Yeah, I don't I don't disagree that it seems like they put a lot of uh, stuff on Dynamite that – you know, maybe you could uh, put on a peak event like a uh, all out and, you know, make that a really jam packed show that people are going to want to see all sorts of shit paying off there. Uh, I don't think you're wrong there. Um, and yeah, I, I also, I, this match seemed like they were uh, throwing such big bombs and, you know, uh, Sammy had such a vicious finish on Hardy with the chair underneath the table and putting him through that. I, I do. Yeah. I don't, I don't know that I want to see him come back and do another one. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm already like predisposed to just wanting to get the fuck away from ladder matches. So I think I would prefer if this was the end of the feud, but yeah, you, you know, you're not wrong. I, I It probably would have been even better had it been on all out. All right, Mike, what was your favorite thing from the show? I think I might be sniping yours, but it's the dark order. I think that they, capitalized on what was a great go home segment last week and they were able to now really incorporate some of the uh, aspects that was really becoming popular with the dark order at least from my read of it from bte and incorporated in here and especially bringing out the six lawn mowers for Brody lee that he bought because of course a hangman had the lower third saying that he needed to buy a new lawn mower and Brody lee bought this with his chili's money but they've found a way to kind of tie this all together with the Dark Order in a way that they made Anna J feel like a big deal. That they've kind of had uh, just levels of things that kind of came across, and it's something that came across with the crowd, and that was something that I was interested in seeing. I do think that the tail end of the Dark Order segment, when we had Dustin and QT, Matt Cardona, and Scorpio Sky coming out, was kind of weak, but like just like how they've put together the dark order and the confidence, like building off of that, that, that they're able to incorporate things from BT that as Nate has said for like the last few, almost like a month or so that this has been the best part of BT and they're incorporating that in there. Brody Lee had a monster promo, like a great promo where it's like straight down the barrel. Like the, they're finally willing to go back to the in-ring promos. Now they have a crowd and Brody had an incredible one. And then they had, Dark Order and Anna J out there trying to get Tay Conti to join the Dark Order. And that's something that's going to be exciting and to follow up there. And then there's still the dangling thing about Cole Cabana. And it's made the Dark Order into such an interesting aspect of the show and really shows a level of confidence with this. And the idea of Brody Lee with the TNT title is something that's going to be fascinating because it we're getting like an abrupt like 180 from how Cody was every week. Now Brody's, it seems like that Brody is going to be a different kind of TNT champion. I'm interested to see where that goes. Yeah, I really, um, I'm really amused and interested in what they're doing with Anna J here. Uh, they gave her the number 99 and was like, oh, she's the chosen one. So she's like, I don't, I don't even know the, 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 
the, the, the numbering scale now, now we are to assume that there are people between 10 and 99. Yeah. Well, she broke the scale because she's, you know, Brodely's the exalted one, but she's the chosen one or something. I don't know. She's the uh, queen it's fun, slayer. It's, the, the queen slayer. Sure. Uh, funny dig at Seth Rollins. Um, but her, like, them going and recruiting Tay Conti at ringside and Tay Conti being like, oh, well, you know, it sure seems like you guys are in a cult, but oh, I want to hug my friend. I just want to do a hug with my friend. Uh, was very amused by how she played that. So uh, they are, they're continuing to keep me invested with the humor. Uh, you know, John Silver got some mic time and then got uh, slapped out of his shoes. So that was fun. Uh, and yeah, really, I think the thing to note here is that Brody Lee has found his character. Remember the, he did a big promo on Dynamite that we all buried. Was it maybe for Christopher Daniels or was it John Moxley? It was for one of one of those first early matches that he had uh, in AEW. And, you know, this was just the, the, you know, polar opposite of that. Totally nailed it. You know, as far as championship celebration segments go, you know, it's a little WWE-ish, but, you know, this uh, did about as good as you can. Yeah, I think the thing for Brody is, I think what we're seeing is confidence, right? Is like the freedom of, oh, wait, this company is actually behind me and I don't have to, you know, when he, when he does that early promo where he struggles, it's like he's kind of push, forcing it because like he's like, this fucking has to work, you know, like I don't want to end up how I was in wwe and now he's like oh they're going to like be patient with me and let me do my thing and it's working i mean we don't know that like how the crowd would have reacted uh to the cody thing but it feels like it's working at least i think everybody reacted uh that, that i know reacted well to it so i think we're just seeing he was like big it was like brody feeling himself he's like i can do whatever i want uh i'm confident I know it's going to work, and uh, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I just think I'm going to talk more about the Dark Order in the delete section, but uh, yeah, I'm happy that they are uh, that it's working out so well as I've as I've always said it was. All right, we can move into delete again. If you've you never didn't, listened, uh, you didn't pick an elite, did you? Oh, I didn't. Man, I want to delete my hosting of this. Just show. a very pretty simple segment. Pretty simple yeah. intro to the show. <laughs> Get it yeah. together. <laughs> I, I did I really snipe your elite pick and that threw you off? No, no. I was sitting. I mean, I didn't. I would probably have gone with Brody, but that's fine. I can pick a different one. Um, that's why I give myself options here on the sheet. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it simple. Uh, the video for the Hikaru Shida Thunder Rosa match for All Out, I really liked. I and I think all of us criticize like the build for the women's title generally, like going into all out, like, okay, what are we doing? We're like two weeks out. And we don't have anything. I still think they could have done a better job <laughs> of doing this, but if we judge them based on what they've presented to us and you have the amount of time that they gave to it, like this video was really good. And it makes Thunder Rosa seem like a much bigger deal than I think she actually is in, in, <laughs> in reality. Because the way they treated her was like a really big outsider coming in to challenge for your title. And now it's like, oh, it's exciting that the first time we're ever going to see this person like live is going to be at the pay-per-view. And I think if you're someone who wasn't familiar with her, you're probably excited to see her. Like, okay, this seems like it's a big deal. And they're building up the title versus title thing. That makes it seem like a big deal. So uh, I, I guess, you know, I'm grading this on a curve because of kind of what I expect uh, out of the women's division here. But the video was good. And now I'm excited about the match. Yeah. Uh, you know, what a novelty to use the fact that somebody is a champion elsewhere to enhance their presentation and be like, oh, this is why you should care about someone and why they're good. That's like pretty good. Two things I'll shout out from the video itself. One, uh, Billy Corgan's voiceover. Love that they got Billy to show up for this uh, and loved even more that he clearly recorded this uh, at his on his laptop at home. Could not make his way to the Zwan studio to uh, <laughs> lay down some vocals on the nice professional mics. Instead, he had to like speak directly into the webcam, uh, which just really tickled me. Uh, and the other thing, again, very good video. Uh, and then, But they did this contract signing in the video where it was just clearly in a hotel room. Uh, and both the women showed up like informal, like, like Hikaru Shida is wearing like a yukata, <laughs> but behind her is like the bathroom. <laughs> it's like, you could, you could close the door. I don't know. 
they, they like lit it with like a purple light maybe even I, maybe just like close the door a little bit so it doesn't close off the whole openness of the set but you can't see the literal hotel sink um but yeah very good yeah it's something that i i, I think i'm like like watching the segment, the thing that like really got me into like the final parts of it was Corrigan's voice. Like maybe I'm so used to, and I'm someone that does not follow Billy outside of Smashing Pumpkins or Zwan. I'm like, oh, his speaking voice, very heavy Chicago voice coming out of him there, and that that popped me. And it it's something that they've shown with like that video segment, which might have been three minutes long, maybe four that you could build up a title match and like have outsiders come in in a way that is incredibly exciting. Like I, it, it's something that, you know, maybe it is because it's been the uh, monopoly of major American wrestling for so long. Like it does not felt like that anyone has treated outsiders very well, but they did such a good job that like, if you're someone that's not deep into like wrestling, because like, to be quite honest, NWA is borderline irrelevant right now. But like bringing someone in there who's like, oh, she's the champion of this, and like you have the the footage from Power, you have like all that there, and you you get to feel like that it's gonna be a, a a big deal. And if it wasn't for the fact that I was already familiar with Thunder Rosa, and I was excited about the prospect of a matchup, I can see someone who's completely unfamiliar being like, okay, this is something to get into, and it it's still something where like you're absolutely right. Like the two week build does feel kind of weak, but I feel like that this was an incredibly effective way to go from a cold storyline that we're like, okay, what's going on for Karashita to now two weeks later being like, all right, that's a, that's a strong way to go for Karashita. And I feel like that, that actually, you know, for like one of the things in the, in the car, I feel like that I've been like harping on over the last few weeks, like this was a very effective way to like change my mind about how they're viewing this title match. I do want to put an inquiry out to the real EE potheads. Uh, pull up your Google images was young bald billy corgan i'm talking about like courtney love era billy corgan was he hot i'm interested to know get back to us this is a controversial topic i think well i you know he looks he looks crazy now he's always wearing like 16 layers uh but you know you pull up some vintage pumpkin stuff and he obviously has a unique charisma and I'm wondering if that translates to just out and out hotness. All right, I'll, I'll wait to hear uh, what the Isis freaks have to say about that. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the delete portion, and nobody delete my pun. God damn it, uh, Nate! Your least favorite thing from Dynamite on Thursday night? Um, gonna delete the contract angle storyline. It honestly wasn't bad. It was, you know, as far as a pro wrestling contract story, it was structured pretty well, right? Like they're setting it up to make you think, oh, Moxley's such a badass that he can sign a contract and not care what's in it and still beat MJF without his move. Uh, but then, you know, they do what you're supposed to do with a baby face is, you know, make him clever and smart and likable. And he actually outsmarts the stupid fucking lawyer and MJF uh, and, you know, added something else to the contract that presumably they had previously signed without reading. Um, you know, all things considered, like, you know, you know, they didn't obviously intend to be bound by that term of the contract by their reactions, but nevertheless, uh, <laughs> seeing, more, seeing more Mark Sterling is like kind of fun. Um, yeah, just, you know, kind of goofy. We we're obviously not high on the MJF gimmick here. I think they brought it a little bit down to earth on this episode and in this segment um but y y you know it's just not my favorite so there was no meeting of the minds <laughs> <laughs> it, it's something where like this segment pretty much proved that the whole dumb mgf 2020 thing never needed to happen it just was so extraneous that you could have had mark sterling say from the front it's like oh yes i am the number one contender however i'm not going to challenge you unless you agree to my stipulations and it's all out it's the biggest show of the year you're going to want to be the headliner, John, as you are like the face of that the, of the company. You're going to want to have the title match. I'm the person with the claim, but we're only going to do it under my stipulations. And, and that makes sense with how he went with Cody, where he had Cody like jump through all the hoops to get into the, the match they had at Revolution. But still, MJF, like, 
I, I have a sneaky suspicion that with how the show is run, MJF and that this segment went on way too long. And really, the whole like MJF p- part of the storyline felt completely useless to me. However, when like Mark Sterling's role in this, I feel like that if Mark Sterling was like, oh, no, I'm speaking for my client here and we got in and out of here in five minutes, we have a lot, a lot better of a time. And then, you know, the one thing that I wish Moxley said, and if Moxley said this, that would have been like thing is like, oh, you ob- you talk about watching tape and watching wrestlers. You obviously haven't watched my most recent title matches where I've not needed to use the paradigm shift to get the win or the paradigm shift did not lead to the win. So that is, it, it's a segment that like, I was running it completely cold towards the uh, men's world title match. And it did a little bit to pull itself out of the nosedive, but I'm still, there's still like all the trappings of it that it's like, should I forgive the last four weeks because they found kind of a funny way to like pull themselves out of the uh, campaign storyline? No, I can't. And for that, it's still something that in long MJF promo and not a very good one. And even with a crowd, it did not seem like, other than like the parts where they were supposed to do that, that there was like any sort of of generational mic worker in JF that we're led to believe come out through here. And, uh, and it went incredibly long. Yeah. I mean, I, I know that our segments about MJF have been good because someone wished us death on Twitter. So, you oh, know, sure. we've been, missed that. you know, we've been doing a great job with our uh, MJF takes. Uh, I pretty much agree with everybody that I thought this was the best version of what they've been doing. Uh, it still wasn't that compelling. The whole, the MJF talking thing is like, it's just, it's bought into its own hype at this point where they're like, okay, MJF is a good promo. Therefore, MJF should talk for 10 minutes without any real reflection as to whether like this version of of the MJF promo is any good or if it does anything uh, of value. There was a way to do this whole thing in like six minutes that, that would have told the same story. Uh, and work just as well. But uh, the biggest thing I hated about this segment was MJF's shoes. Uh, Jeez, buddy. he was like the worst trust guy on the show, wasn't he? Your whole thing is supposed to be like, you know, elite taste. And you got this light blue suit with your black fucking dress shoes. It looked like shit. Uh, you know, uh, call anybody. I mean, fucking call Brody Lee. He might help you pick out shoes to go with your suit. Mark Sterling is right there. He could help you. Uh, but, you know, it just looked bad. Ricky Starks. Ricky, Ricky Starks. Stark. Out, Ricky Starks out there with having the, the pants, like, showing off the le- the foot and then wearing slides in the ring, you know, wearing slippers in the ring. Like, there's people you could go to because he it's something that, like, he's supposed to, like, be, like, this rich person. But maybe this is, like, a critique of rich people that ultimately the idea of that very rich people have no taste. And maybe like that could work aesthetically as well. I, I don't think it's that complex. Uh, uh, I, I just I, I was trying to give them an out. <laughs> That's fair. That's I fair. do. I, uh, you know, I give them a little credit if they saw the election stuff wasn't working as intended and they adjusted to make it just more of a, a contract lawyer sort of story. Um, I also all will be forgiven. Like when Moxley wins, I think uh, if MJF wins, then we're in trouble. But I'm pretty high on Moxley just as a champion, as the champion right now. You know, number one of the PWI. Uh, he did a long interview with Meltzer the other day that I was just like, oh, you know, superstar shit all day on here. Um, so, I, you know, if he keeps winning, I'm kind of fine with it. He got received by the crowd here as a big star, even though that kind of like petered out. Uh, so, yeah, you know, Moxley just gets another strong win here and they go to work on elevating somebody else. Uh, then I'm I'm really fine with it. Does it worry you the possibility that he's confident he's going to be able to have this match with Kenta because he knows he's losing to MJF? Um, so, no, it doesn't worry me because I don't know his confidence level. In the interview, he's like, oh, we're working on it. He didn't seem like, oh, it's definitely super going to happen. Um, and honestly, I think, like, I think, you know, maybe Moxley retains and – they work them out in New Japan. Honestly, the way to do it is Kenta comes out on Dynamite uh, and Moxley loses to him by way of MJF interference or something. And then you just give Kenta the dirty win because, you know, that's how he was working his way through the tournament anyway. Um, I think that's fine because then you're not hurting your champion 
you're advancing a feud. I mean, you're hurting your champion a little bit, advancing the feud. Uh, and then, you know, you have a, a chip to cash in with New Japan at some point, so you can do Okada versus Omega on your MSG show. Um, <clears throat> Mike, what uh, what's your dealy pick, bud? So, the uh, well, the women's match. The uh, God the damn hand- it, Mike! Why are you taking? I got my name oh. on there. <laughs> oh, I just got my talk- name on the sheet. Uh, okay, I'll change. I'll change it to something else. Uh, Hangman eats first. I'm Let's point- talk about. I'm hangman. pointing at the thing, even though he can't I actually see me works pointing. With- Oh, no, actually, it works because of how I have the window set up. You are pointing at me, and I do deserve to be yelled at. I did not I, I did not notice the dibs. I was just looking through things like, okay, what do I hate right now? Uh, Hangman's Eats first. So first off, we're going to bring something back here. The Hangman meter is coming back for the first time in a long time. Of course, long-time EE heads know that the Hangman meter is denoting on how much of a baby face to heel he was as during the time he was kind of fluctuating a whole lot, and then there really had not been a lot of things to really denote if Hangman was a heel or a face. I don't even remember where our last average was, but on a scale from 1 to 10, Hangman eating first, doing the very melodramatic way to uh, to make to interfere and make sure that the Bucks did not advance on to against FTR and the gauntlet match. How much of a heel was Hangman Page? It's 1 to 10? 1 to 10, 1 being a pure babyface. We're talking... Vaughn Erickson, Texas. We're talking Dusty in Florida. We're talking Tanahashi. And then 10, of course, being the most uh, evil heel of all. The fan. Yeah, pretty. Uh, uh, yeah, Fritz Von Erich Sr. Is, is 10, maybe. Um, Fritz, von, Fritz Von Erich before they dropped the whole Nazi thing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm going to put him at a seven. Pretty, okay. you know, pretty clear heel, heel move. Uh, you know, he's not been. Having bad blood with the young bucks for the, uh, you know, last ascertainable little while. What a weird turn of phrase that was. Um, he just, you know, they were they seemed to have arrived at what their relationship was going to be. It's like, hey, you know, we're not best friends or whatever, but we get along fine. Uh, and then, you know, just comes out and uh, nakedly uh, <laughs> prevents them from winning uh, in order to advance his own uh, aims and goals and to you know, uh, get in better with the stupid FTR geeks. Um, yeah, it's pretty clear here move. Um, heel kind of, uh, <laughs> his, his selling of it was kind of heelish to me and his garish cowboy hat. You know, I think that's probably the right way to play it is oh, I'm not even, I can't even, I'm not going to look Matt Jackson in the eyes. Uh, it was a little bit corny in that regard. Um, so yeah, you know, honestly, you'd probably have a higher heel rating, except that the young bucks are, you know, kind of, uh pricks by nature in their characters so uh you know you give them a little bit of a discount for that yeah it's a tough one like obviously the action is heelish i mean it's like eight nine level heel stuff but then when you watch like the rest of what they're doing it's clear that they're like they're going to give him a motivation for it and that obviously heels can have motivations but they're going to give him like a shades of gray motivation as they've done with this character all along which I think they need to abandon one way or the other. Like, let Hangman be Hangman. Let Hangman eat first, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Um, so yeah, I pretty much I pretty much agree with Nate. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go seven. I'm gonna go seven as well. So the index score is a seven. We hit the slot machine. There we go. It's a, Jack it's a point seven here. We, the, we just the striper hit number. Off. The striper number, that's right. Yeah, striper number right here. It, it's something also that like when you like combine that also with the really kind of cringe promo that like the Bucks stormed in on Heyman drinking and they finally said, oh, you, you've you wanted to be done for a while. Well, guess what? We now say we're done. You're just like, OK, like they finally took him seriously. And it took them like them being very self-important. It took, it took him like acting out one of their matches to do so, which I mean, that that's. You, you could judge that on the idea of how how the young bucks are heels that people cheer to begin with, and then like you have like the you have like the door slam, and then like the very obvious like target mirror they've put up there that they tastefully shattered. That like he was looking through a shattered mirror and just came off as like early like nineties uh, WCW. Oh, this water isn't hot thing. Like that's what it kind of felt like. Like he was giving like that kind of impression. And for someone like Hangman who before we lost crowds was 
probably the one like homegrown like organic face that like has been like was like receiving a lot of momentum it just is it's a lot of like dissonance there and it, it's something that after i realized i was stepping on someone's toes this was the, the thing i disliked the most on the show i have to, i have to object to i kind of liked the backstage confrontation and corny mirror shot um i don't know if i have a great justification for why it worked for me i think matt jackson is an underrated promo i think um i don't know i i feel like people have a conception of his earlier promos that kind of has carried on to what he is able to do now but i really think he you know threaded a pretty difficult needle here to be like you know i'm doing a wrestling confrontation skit backstage here and i want to get over that i'm pissed and I want to get over that I'm also kind of hurt because, you know, this is my my guy who's in the elite with me. Uh, and, you know, we're finally coming to the end of our relationship there. And I it, I think it was pretty successful in hitting those notes without being totally awkward, you know, Johnny Gargano holding Tommaso Ciampa's hand kind of stuff. Uh, the mirror shot was considerably closer to like, you know, uh, one final beat level shit. Uh, it, it was just kind of... I don't know. Something about the corniness made it uh, charming to me. It it wasn't just that. It was also like Hangman's facials when he's like after he did the thing, you know? It's like, all right. Yeah. This well, is yeah. not natural for Hangman. Uh, he needs to do something else. Um, yeah, no. Badass is, is more natural for him. Um, yeah. Which it's is not... why I, I think he's going to, you know, I think the point they want to arrive at him is like, uh, you know, anti-hero, cool heel, you know, you know, heelish baby face kind of guy. So maybe that's the right way is that he's going to do something heelish here, but they're going to give him a justification for it. Um, but, you know, you kind of want to see him get back to the hold my beer and I'm going to knock this guy out. That sort of, uh, that sort of heelish baby face more than, uh, you know, sad sack alcoholic baby face. Yeah. And if, if they lose to FTR, which is what I assume happens at all out, he can kind of, that can be kind of like a, you know, shake him situation where he's like, wait, well, I was really fucked up here. And now I'm right. To... That, that, that can set him apart from both groups. Right. And be like, Oh, I really, I fucked over my friends on one side for this other team who just came and took my belt. What the fuck was I doing? Right. Uh, okay. I think that makes it my turn to, to delete. Uh, I mean, as suggested, I'm going to delete the, uh, the women's match. Um, okay. I should let this die at some point, but I can't. I'm physically incapable of letting go of this, letting it die. The women's division is bad. It's booked poorly. Anyone who tells you different is wrong, and they are telling on themselves for a variety of reasons. And here's why. Here is, hold on, let me pull out the facts. Let me pull out some objective facts on how we know the women's division is bad. Well, one way we know it's bad is this match. Right. The what we were presented with here was three people trying to have a match, none of whom are are very good uh, at like at their current state. They may two of them, I think, will uh, eventually be quite good, but they didn't have the people who could really pull off what they were trying to go for here. And I still am not exactly sure uh, what they were trying to go for, because it was a bad idea to begin with. So that's one way we know that the women's division is booked poorly. Poor execution of a bad idea. But here's the other way we know the women's division is booked poorly. The, the justification has been it was going badly. They were getting poor ratings. Then COVID happened and it took away a bunch of their talent. So they're just kind of in this waiting period. I, I believe that's the narrative of why the women's division is good. The Dark Order disproves that entirely, 100%. The Dark Order, I mean, people were wrong about this, but people thought the Dark Order was bad at one point, right? And the Dark Order thing, uh, the crowd didn't react to, and uh, my buddy Tony pumped the brakes on it, moved things around. But how long has this Dark Order thing been going on? Forever. Since before TV. Like we're, like we're coming right. up on a solid like 15 months of Dark Order at this point because right. they debuted at Double or Nothing 2019. 
And did they take it off TV? No. Did they say, oh, wait, COVID, some of our people are gone, which they were. Did they rely on that? No. They just did better ideas until it was better. That was it. If they want the women's division to be better, they should do better ideas. That's my take. Delete this match. Delete the bullshit justifications for the women's division. Yeah, I'm not going to argue with you. Uh, I will say uh, I, I enjoy the Rebel and Reba character. Uh, I enjoy that her not being very good at wrestling is appropriate for her character because she's not a wrestler. She's, you know, a makeup artist for the company. Uh, and it makes me wonder what they're going to do with the lawyer, Mark Sterling, next week. Are they going to be like, oh, by the way, he's also a wrestler? Because that's kind of, that would be goofy. Uh, or is he going to work it like I'm an untrained wrestler? Um, and yeah, I just, that part of Rebel to me is like, oh, yeah, she's supposed to be bad and she's bad. Uh, so she's achieving her, uh, you know, intended character purpose here and therefore is good. Uh, but no, it wasn't good. And it's something where they don't put the women's division in situations to succeed. They constantly have the women's division behind the eight ball. They constantly put it into positions where I knew before the show even happened that this match was going to be getting zero time and it was going to be right before the main event, which was going to be the tables match. Like if you followed how they construct their TV cards, it was very clear that this was like set up to be like right there. And then I assume that time was cut from the match. The match itself was terrible. You, you really aren't putting these people in positions for them to succeed. And, you know, for something like the idea that now big swole gets her match with uh, Britt Baker, this didn't need to happen. This did not need to happen. Just like MJF did not need to go on a campaign to get a title shot. MJF had the justification at the title shot just with the win-loss record and the rankings that are supposed to be important. Like, you did not need to... Like, you already had Big Swole get her match before this. So, why are we even doing this match? Other than we have to have this, this match here because we want to have exactly one woman's match each show. And then you put on a match like this, you get them zero time, you get like this, and this ends up feeling like a lot of the issues that WWE had pre before the four horsewomen came up where like people were getting their matches cut, they were being cut from shows. And it's just like, if you're not going to like let them succeed and you're going to try to hide behind COVID here, just be upfront about why you're not letting them succeed. Like don't be dishonest saying, Oh, COVID has been like this. Cause these are the same problems that I mean, going back and having going through the notes of how they've booked the women's division, they've relied on in a lot of ways. They relied on the fact that a lot of international wrestlers, they did not have to have, have to have like, angles with them or storylines with them they could just have them in matches they did not have to have like things like that the, like the whole like oh we're doing this and that and it's frustrating it's one of those things that when i see articles it's like it's actually been good and it's like they found some talent here they've we've seen both big swole and penelope ford improve like demonstrably but let's not act like that that's like a balm to cure all the wounds that they have in this division but you know what is a balm that can cure all your wounds it's winning Winning cures everything. Uh, and if you want to win, you can do so at my bookie. Uh, and the good thing about winning and winning season is right now you can double your first deposit at my bookie. So it's a chance to win big. That's up to a thousand dollars on your first deposit. So you put in a hundred bucks, they'll give you an extra hundred bucks. You put in a thousand bucks, they'll give you an extra thousand bucks. It's NBA playoffs time, NHL playoffs, baseball's happening, UFC. Uh, everything's happening. What you want to do is use your promo code, which is going to be ELITE, E-L-I-T-E, at my bookie. Use that. You'll get the up to $1,000 extra, and you can bet on things related to AEW. Are you ready for the AEW prop, folks? Because I've got it for you. Here's okay, what I want to know. On the next... AEW live event with fans, which will be next week. Will Kendra Lust appear and get involved in a match? Is this real? This is real. Is, Ken is, Ken is Kendra Lust a character on the Major Wrestling Figures podcast? I don't know the answer is, to that. Is that, she, is that her connection? She's a character on, uh, on Pornhub.com. <laughs> sure 
I'm just, I, I, I feel like there's some, she has some tangential re- relationship to wrestling that would make them pose this question. Well, she's a big wrestling fan. Uh, okay. She, she also, um, I mean, she posts about wrestling a lot on her Twitter account. And she has, uh, I think she made, I'm not sure if it was a whole porno or if it was just like a picture that was supposed to be like her fucking John Cena. Uh, I think with Johnny Sins as John Cena. So, you know, good stuff. But yes, Kendra Lust, uh, here's the here's the bet. Jumps over the barricade and interferes. Minus 500. So a, a, a heavy favorite. Stays behind the barricade and does not interfere is at plus 300. So where are you guys fall- coming down on this bet? Uh, well, I was unaware that this was existing to begin with <laughs> up until you sprung this on me. Uh, this is why I didn't want you to read the prop bets before the show, Mike. <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, I'm going to go with that she does not appear on screen. I think that's going to be the minus 500. Yes, I'm not going to be making much money off that, but I'm of the no, 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 that- no, no, no. If she doesn't appear at all, I think that's a plus three. I think you get plus 300 on that. Okay, then I'm going plus 300. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going in on that. I'll go the plus 300 there. Yeah, that's easy one for me. Easy well, money. It's hard for me to tell how this pays because I, I guess does Kendra Lust have to appear on the show? And then it's whether she jumps over the barricade and interferes or stays behind the barricade and does not interfere. Hard to say. I, I, I mean, I'm willing to put money on that she doesn't even appear. So I'm going to go behind the barricade, does not interfere. So plus three hundred. Okay. And uh, Nate, your take? Yeah, I'm, I'm inclined to agree. I um, I'm trying to see on her timeline if there's any reference. Oh, uh, she retweeted the murder hawk monster Lance Archer uh, yesterday. So that appears to be the only explicit AEW reference that I hear, see here. Well, I am not going to open an incognito window, and I'm going to type in Kendra Lust AEW. Uh, So I did that first, and you get a lot of results about her denying an affair with John Cena. Yeah, sure. Sure, buddy. That was from like 2013. Okay, well, I don't know what what the thing is, like what the tie here is, but (laughs) when I saw this, I couldn't stop myself uh, from bringing it up on the show, so... Hey, you know, goes to show there are some uh, prop bets out there you can stand to win on. Hey, uh, another Murder Hawk Monster Lance Archer retweet from three days ago. Yeah. So So she seems to have a favorite, maybe. (laughs) So it doesn't matter what you're into. That's the point that I'm making. Plenty of stuff you can bet on at my bookie. Uh, Remember, use the promo code ELITE. That's E-L-I-T-E. And you will get uh, a double on your deposit if it's your first deposit. So 100% double. So go there. Your winning season begins today only at my bookie. All right, now it's time to talk about the ratings from this week. A little different week because um, AW ran at a different time. NXT ran at a different time. Mike, you've done some wild notes here. So I'm just going to let you uh, drive this, this bus, buddy. So it's been a kind of a weird week, but there are a couple things that I wanted to kind of focus on that I did do this. I'm not the, the church of the demigod bit just because we're not really having head to head does not apply here. So I'm just going to talk about stuff I've noticed. So AEW on Thursday had 813,000 total viewers. That was good for 11th in all of cable. And then with a 0. 0.29, 14 to, or 18 to 49 demographic. Since we didn't talk about this on the live show or on the weekly show on Saturday, they had 755 all of, of across all viewers. They finished fifth on cable on Saturday with a 0. 0.31 demo. The interesting thing that I found about this is, so they moved back to a weekday spot. That they did not have a whole lot of turnaround. There has not been a lot of Turner promotion, obviously, with things going on and with how the NBA players have had a strike over the last few days. So there has not been the, the promotion tie-in that you have seen with TNT. AEW has been all over it. But it's interesting, like, looking at this and comparing it to two weeks ago, their last, like, televised thing on a weekday. And they are down 
three hundredths of a point in the demo. They're up approximately twenty one thousand, and they're kind of same with the de- with the overall demo. But the thing I found interesting was a big point was being made over the last few weeks about how the the viewers that are really coming towards AEW were women in the and they were getting higher viewership uh, across households, but that's plummeted since they've had the TV changes. They had a couple consistent weeks of 0.26 females, 18 to 49, and both on Saturday and Thursday that had a similar 0.19, which I find very interesting. And it's something that we've now seen the fact that AEW fans are willing to, that they, they are a very uh, dedicated group and it's something that we've not seen before with companies changing time slots. And of course, TNA had a huge issues when they tried to change time slots over the years. And then we, we seen it kind of stay the same, not a whole lot of growth built off of it and not a whole lot of that. And it's like something also that like when SmackDown got moved to Fox sports one, that one week, they completely cratered and they had like one of the worst like showings that you can imagine. And AEW's kind of stay the same. So it'll be interesting how Wednesday will be Wednesday will be, They'll be running unimposed. Uh, uh, WWE NXT is moved to Tuesday night because of the Stanley Cup playoffs. And really, like NXT, it's kind of something that they weren't able to grow- to have any like positive growth. They kind of stayed similar, and they lost thirty one thousand overall viewers. That might be because of the Republican National Convention, which ran away with the night on cable. The only other thing that I know is in the top ten that was not news related was Real Housewives. So AEW. You know, I mean, they finished 11th, but it was a one of those like, environmental TV nights. And the fact that it's kind of stayed the same, it, it's not like a like raw, raw moment, but something that I think that they would be probably pretty happy with how things are. At least that's my individual read of the situation. Uh, what were your takeaways from all this? I have no takeaways on this rating, except that it's good to good to stay pretty steady when you have a, a whole night change because it's hard for people to follow shows as you mentioned uh, i do want to give a shout out to again the uh john mox interview with dave Meltzer that he did uh at the very end of the interview he starts asking dave questions about the ratings he's like oh you know i don't know this stuff dave but you know we started we started this company you know just to create an alternative and we weren't trying to go to war with anybody we just wanted to give people another option or whatever uh but you know do you think with the way things have been going and with our uh you know viewers is there a way that we could like pass wwe in the next five years to which dave replies oh well you know in young people you know you've basically already passed raw and smackdown with the way that your audience has stayed steady and those have cratered in the uh pandemic so if things keep going as you're going uh yeah absolutely you'll, you'll pass them in less than five years uh, which really fires john moxley up he <laughs> you can hear you can hear him audibly get excited uh, you know, he gave this lip service to the idea that uh, he didn't want to go to depth war with WWE or talk bad about them, uh, but obviously still hates them. Uh, his wife just left the company, obviously. Uh, and then as the as the interview is wrapping up, you can actually hear him, and I imagine involuntarily, like, clapping to himself. He's, like, clapping. He's, like, <laughs> <laughs> the, ener- the energy is just radiating off him, and it's very fun to listen to. Well, you know, John Moxley uh, is a guy who, I think it's clear, just lost a little hair over the last uh, several years. MJF said as much. Yeah, MJF pointed that out. And, you know, I think this is true of Boxley, but it's true of a lot of us. A lot of our identities wrapped up in our hair. Uh, you know, so in your 20s, 30s, and this happened to Mox, you know, you start noticing the signs, the first signs of hair loss. Feels like panic time. I think we definitely saw panic time with Mox, right? He went through those, like, weird hairstyles that he was trying out in, in WWE before he kind of gave it more of the cut that he has in AAW because, of course, no guy's ever ready to go bald. But thankfully, and maybe not for Mox, but thankfully now there's Keeps, the simple and easy way to keep your hair uh, because two out of three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35. Uh, I know I've got the receding hairline rocking. And the best way to prevent hair loss is to do something about it while you still have hair left. Uh, keeps, the key to Keeps is that you don't have to go to the doctor's office to get your prescription. You can visit a doctor online, get hair loss medication delivered to you. Uh, You get it delivered every three months, so you don't have to go to the pharmacy. You don't have to go for doctor's visits. uh, And you get generic versions of the two FDA-approved hair loss products. So even if you tried them before, uh, you never got them at this price before. 
And remember that prevention is the key. You want to, it can take up to four to six months to see results. So you want to do it before you're losing your hair. The sooner you start using Keeps, the more hair you'll save. So you can start Keeps treatments at just $10 a month. And for a limited time, you can get your first month free. You want to go to keeps.com slash elite to receive your first month for free. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash elite. Okay, let's go through what we haven't talked about from Dynamite this week. So we started, we saw Chris Jericho come out to go to commentary. And then we went right into the gauntlet tag match for the shot at the tag team titles at All Out. FTR is your ultimate winner. It went like this. The Young Bucks started with the Natural Nightmares, and the Bucks won that with the BTE trigger. Then the Best Friends came out, and that is when uh, Hangman ate first. He got involved. Trent rolled up Matt because Hangman held Nick's leg to give the Best Friends the win. Then we got the Best Friends versus FTR. We saw Chuck have a little bit of a, a knee issue, uh, I think, during the match with the Bucks, if I recall correctly. Right, and- yeah. Uh, FTR exploited that and ultimately Dax tapped out Chuck with a leg lock uh, to win and get the shot at the titles at all out. Yeah, I think they demonstrated why a gauntlet match like this is a useful booking tool because you can, you know, give uh, give FTR a big win leading up to the title match like we discussed. And, you know, you're not hurting the Bucks here because uh, they had to wrestle two matches and, you know, I guess they gave me the out of interference either way. I uh, also want to shout out uh show opened with a bunch of shots of fans because they did have uh paid attendance on this show something you know 500 600 range uh and you know it seems like there was genuine effort at doing it as safely as possible uh you know lots of reports on twitter that you know everybody was seated far apart from each other they had rubber bands and stuff to prevent people from sitting moving seats and sitting closer to other people uh, and everybody was wearing masks to the point that there were some people not wearing masks that were kicked out of the show. So, uh, you know, as we, you know, obviously we've discussed this a lot, but uh, if they're going to do shows and going to do shows with fans, you know, seems like they at least, uh, you know, did the prevention me- measures as best they could. Um, but yeah, you know, I wasn't overall, I guess, on this match super high on it. It was fine. I actually, oh, I'm sorry, Mike, go ahead. I was going to say, before like the uh, kind of underwhelming Best Friends and FTR thing, that oh, this was another thing that, Nate, you were lucky with Fight TV that you were able to see most of the match without the picture-in-picture because it seemed like all the escalation and a lot of the bring work on Chuck happened during the commercial, and it was mm-hmm. very frustrating in that regard. I was really like – the first two legs of this, I enjoyed a whole lot. I thought that QT legs. Marshall – yeah, the first two legs of the t- of the match. Yeah, there's, this is a three leg match. He's making a, a leg joke because Chuck Curtis. I mean, leg joke. Yeah, yeah, quote. yeah. I, all all yeah. he did was say the word legs in a weird way. Legs. Yeah, yeah. He's just saying legs like a total pervert over here, and I'm just trying to talk about. Legs. I, I mean, I imagine that if you're saying this legs and you're wearing burger. a bow tie, it would be like a Tex Avery cartoon where like the bow tie goes. Legs. You're not helping your point of being, of seeming like a creep right now. So uh, I lo- really like the Bucks and the Natural Nightmares. It was a lot of QT. QT looks like QT's looks lean, and he was doing his weird stuff, and he lost because of the the him doing like his dickhead backflip. And then Young Bucks and Best Friends. It's something that like these are teams that have known each other now for so long, and they've had various like interactions with the four of them with like the bucks doing a lot of, of work in Chikara and dragon gate usa which had chuck taylor and then of course all the new japan stuff with trent that they have such like great chemistry and the one thing i noticed was they did a whole lot of like odes to naruki doi in this match so they did like the the ropes long uh sent on that naruki doi does every match and then they it was just like a good time and then the ftr thing kind of ground things down to the halt it was effective and it was kind of predictive. It was like, okay, how are they going to get the bucks out of here so they don't burn that money match? And they found a way with uh, uh, Hank Manning, Hank Manning first. 
and we talked enough about that earlier earlier but it was it was a fun match i probably liked like the first two legs of this bentley the first two legs of this legs now you're just playing into it i'm not going to acknowledge that uh you you really brought that on yourself mike you you basically begged them for it I, I am really like the punished person on this show. I've realized. Again, you you said legs, Bentley legs twice. You're <laughs> asking him to do that. But like the, these are this is probably like the two best in ring portions of the show. She's yeah. got legs. Um. So here's my thing. Oh, first, well, I, let me say the match thing first. But, I mean, you guys have already said it. I just, it's like, I think they fucked FTR here because FTR, the thing over best friends didn't feel that big to me. It didn't feel that like, okay, we're catapulting you into this title shot. Whereas like the match could have built that way, but it's like, oh, Chuck hurt his leg and they just like took advantage of his leg and they won. Okay, that's cool, I guess. I just feel like there could have been a, a better way to do this that would have made them, they already seemed hot going into the title challenge. Like I think they lost momentum in this match versus where they were before it started. So... But my thing on the fans is I actually think letting the fans into the building is safer. Like the fan situation is safer than the wrestling situation. Like I would have, based on what I saw on Twitter, I would have no problem going to the show. Like you can sit just with your family and friends, like people you're comfortable being with. Everybody's got a mask on. You don't have to touch anybody for concessions or even for merch. Uh, so, I mean, and you don't have to interact with people. I think we've all kind of learned that like touching probably isn't as bad as we initially thought it was, as long as you don't have to interact with people face to face and you don't have to, uh, I thought it was funny that Tony Khan, he, he did his little pre-show pep talk and he's like, wear your mask because otherwise we can't shoot the fans, <laughs> not because otherwise you'll kill yourself, but, uh, you know, we can't shoot the fans if you don't, <laughs> but yeah, stop shooting the fans. <laughs> sure. I don't so, want to see the fans. <laughs> no, I don't want to see the fans. I don't give a damn about the fans. No. So, uh, But yeah, I mean, with some reflection, I mean, I thought it was a bad idea like when it was first mentioned, but with some reflection and seeing what it looks like, uh, I think it's safer to go to the show than it is to work the show. Yeah, I, I, I think I was proven right by uh, by Big TK there. Um, the I will say it, you know, there were points in this show that felt better than any points pre-fans like like when probably, Matt Cardona came out yeah like you didn't I think maybe the wrestlers at ringside felt they didn't have to do as much because they're not now they have real fans there uh which is not you know I just don't think is the case a lot of those fans they might have been super excited but they're very far away but those people at ringside should be like actively cheerleading uh so you have the effect of the near ring noise uh and then that's you know you're heightening that for the for the crowd that's sitting you know, considerably further behind. I want to go back and pretend I just did the last legs thing. And now I want to say, I don't know, Mike, I think this joke has legs. (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) Uh, There we go. That's the AP joke of the week. (laughs) Okay. Then we went to a Darby video. Uh, He's wearing a Ricky Starks mask as he is wont to do. He says, you really think I'm afraid? And then he jumps off a bridge interesting uh musical choice here you know some some real pacific northwest emo sparkle horse shit on this <laughs> it's something where like maybe it's with like it was really well presented like the first few times but it might be me but like the darby doing stuff videos are kind of just uh grating on me because it's like oh this time i'm jumping off a bridge into a river and after like all the stuff there i'm like uh, are they like what's the point like that's a thing like other than like containing the thing i guess like a from a storytelling like perspective other than like his focus on team taz like there's really not much there and i'm kind of frustrated with that at this point with darby yeah no i can't complain about their presence they establish his character uh and you never know you know how many people are tuning in for the first time so and they're also like two minutes long so you know better this than i don't know a hard jr ad read for his barbecue sauce after that we went into lance archer defeating evolved legend sean maluda really tying between the uh the different versions of this podcast i hit him with the blackout 
Then he slammed his head into the mat a few times. Then he used the EVD claw to pin him. Uh, after the match, we got a Jake Roberts promo. He says 20 other men think they're going to win the Casino Battle Royale. So I guess that was announced at some point before this, and I heard people talking about it, but I missed when it was actually announced. But it's happening. Uh, he says, but only one man is going to win. It damn sure better be you. Uh, of course, talking to Lance Archer. He says he wants Lance to wipe that one blemish off their record, which is not winning the previous battle royale because that's cost them so much time. Uh, and then he like keeps kind of rambling on clearly. I mean, then, you know, you realize it's because he was waiting for a music cue. He was Vampiro waiting for his music to hit uh, <laughs> so he could interfere. And uh, it was Team Taz's music. Taz comes out and then they just have the most awkward exchange here because Taz is trying to get in whatever they've talked about. And Jake is just jumping the gun. And uh, yeah, anyway. Uh, Team Taz and uh, Lance don't like each other. They're all going to be involved with each other at the Casino Battle Royale. Uh, And then Darby Darby Allen's music hits. He comes out. He attacks Ricky. They brawl. Cage and Archer are being kept apart in the ring. And uh, I guess all this is going to play out in the Battle Royale. No singles match between Darby and Ricky. Or, yeah, Darby and Ricky, which is what I was expecting. Yeah, that's a little bit frustrating seeing how well this was one of the better storylines they've been building up over the last few months. And they did have like the escalation that feels like it's going to be there. But uh, the promo stuff, it just kind of was like Taz was like, oh, we're in this or now there's like a Team Taz theme as well. That like when they came out, I was like, okay, who is this? Like, are we getting a new debut now? But instead it was just Taz and them. Uh, there was the moment that when Ricky, when Darby came out, like this instantly like escalated to a point that I felt like it was like a satisfying conclusion. But the promo was just kind of there. Uh, Archer versus Sean Maluda. Sean Maluda has crossed the line, and I'm happy to see that he is now in Jacksonville because that was a really fun squash match. I tell you what, I would have put on Elite. My wife just brought me a plate of sugar cookies that she's just baked fresh out of the oven uh Ely SB Ely for sure okay nobody agrees that's fine MJF I, is back I, I don't I haven't had one of these cookies yeah, I don't you have to you have to not. give us the cookie then to, yeah but yeah. just imagine that someone has just brought you a plate of hot cookies oh no that owns I uh very as I said very busy days like the busiest time of the year for us at, at the office uh, so one of the office ladies brought by a monstrous coffee cake, uh, plus some kind of regular cake, plus obscenely over-decorated cookies. Like one was just a full replica of SpongeBob's face. So I eat, I eat two cookies, and that was one and a half too many. So I'm sure they're wonderful cookies. I could not have one. I mean, I, I could get down on a snack. You know, I'm a big treats fan. Not as much as Big Treat Aaron Tao, but I do love a treat. But, you know, it, it's something, though, with, like, cookies, though. Like, I did have a very good cookie day. Welcome to Cookie Corner. This is our segment within a segment, a show within a show, where we talk about cookies that we had today. I had a cranberry white chocolate cookie today, and it was actually really delightful. Yeah. I mean, when we drop when we drop the graphic for this, I want to note that it's cookies with a K. Right. Yes, cookies <laughs> with a K. And like the the great thing about it was that the uh, white chocolate made it so creamy. So it was like cookies and cream in a lot of ways. Oh, cookies and cream. Exactly. Exactly. You see, that's how you work in a pun. Um, <laughs> I think this joke has legs. Also, uh, tell me. So, what's like the base of the cookie here? Oh, it's a standard like dough. Like it's not like a. It's like a sugar chocolate. cookie type. Yeah, type. it's it's this a, is the dough cookie. <laughs> the dough is in fact a cookie. It's not a shortbread, or which is what they would call cookies often in the UK or tray bakes. But uh, it's a. Uh, it was just like the standard like one that like was like butter, brown sugar, and then big okay. like it had like the discs of white chocolate in there. Okay, and, then, and some cranberry. And then, oh, a lot of cranberries, big hunks of cranberry, okay. and a big. Okay, we got hunks of cranberry. It's not like we're not talking about cranberry filling here, right? No, 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 no. We're we're talking actual cranberries in these pieces. Okay. And and, and here's the thing uh, about it, your old pal, big cranberry fan. Fan. I love like cranberry bread. Cran fan. Oh, I'm a cran <laughs> fan. I am a huge cran <laughs> fan. Love cranberry juice. I just love cranberries. I like a tart fruit. 
You know, Do you like uh, Cranberries, comma V, the band. Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, I think that Zombie was a tremendous single and probably one of the best one to hit wonders of the time. But I know that they had an incredible overall music. So I'm not going to besmirch them by just referring to Zombie. But that's the one song I know of at the moment here. But big Do you cranberry, like Cranberry Flan? <laughs> you know, if I had Cranberry Flan, I'd probably be a big fan of the Cranberry Flan. Cran of the Flan, Cran Flan. I, I'm a fan of the Cran Flan. What can I say? So. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, 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 what's the deal with SB Sugar Cookies? Are we talking about like? I, I, I don't want to hear any more about the cookies. To be honest. <laughs> Nate, Nate's opting out of the story here. They're good. I, I thought I've already OD'd on cookies today. <laughs> Cookie OD. And, and thank you for uh, joining us for Cookie Corner, both with cookies. K's. Cookie Corner. And... I regret to inform the the listenership that Cookie Corner has been canceled henceforth. <laughs> 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 and the, the no actually i take back the joke i was about to make sorry i i, I think i knew we were going to go to and yeah well this we're, we're hitting the offer oh, here joke and... about cookies being canceled is that canceled no. with a K? well <laughs> it was going to be canceled with a k but then i realized that cookie quarter canceled was three k's and i didn't want to no, 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 no not with a k and now no, i've the... done it yep y y you failed <laughs> <laughs> all right uh Speaking of white people, MJF, mine, to be clear, mine was not a KKK joke. It was an Eric Stevens joke, just so that's clear. Well, that's was... what mine was. Yeah, that that's a, that was what the jokes I were making was very clearly Eric Stevens jokes, the family food dude. <laughs> Apparently, Aaron Bentley is not up on family food dude. I, uh, I, I was I was there. I was with you guys. He does cookies with a K. That's yeah. that's what I was saying. Oh my god. Okay. Love MJF. Explain. It's backstage. It's getting hot in here. I've got Captain Tsubasa to play. I'm saying go. <laughs> go. Speak. Yeah, but now I'm pausing for comedy. <laughs> Again, very, very unusual idea of comedy. Um, I do have an unusual idea. Tig, tig Nataro, you're not. <laughs> no, I'm not. Ah, okay. MJF. It was, it was dumb. Then we got the video for the women's title match. Um, Mega Parekh was there. That was good. Uh, as I, Yes, as Nate said, Sheeta in the Yukata. Uh, Rosa was also styling. This was just a stylish video. Mega was styling. They showed up in four more. Yeah, everybody had it going on. Then we got the contract signing. Uh, we've basically explained the point here, right? I mean, they yeah. remind us. Yeah, of the yeah. Calls yeah, we got it. Band. He says, sign it. He does a whole thing where he name drops Zandig. Oh, yeah, that was okay. That was a good shout out. Yeah, that was a good shout out. But if you're going to shout out Zandig, you have to do the muscle pose. And there was no muscle pose. Do you guys think Mike Tyson actually made this comment about John Moxley that probably MJF said? Probably. Yes. I could see him being kind of thinking that or the paycheck was good. So he was going to say that. And if you <laughs> ask him now, he'd probably see, he'll probably tell you that he said it, even if he didn't. Yeah, so he says, uh, you don't really need anything to, to beat me. Mox gets up. Sterling says he's going to sue him if he does anything. So then he says, yeah, he doesn't mind to sign it. So he does. That's when he comes out with the thing about how. He added something on page 17. Mox and Mark Sterling are flummoxed. And he says, next week we're going to have a little tune-up match, me versus Mark Sterling. And if you don't show up, Bonehead doesn't get his title match. And the paradigm shift isn't banned in that match. You love okay. to see, uh, as as Nate said, you like to see the baby face getting over. So it's good. Mm -hmm. We got a Santana and Ortiz video. They said we wrecked your mom's van, and the best thing you could do is ask for an apology. Okay, we'll apologize. I'm sorry, your mom wasn't in the van when we wrecked it. Time to pay your dues to the illest. This was a great good video. Also, great video. I think Santana and Ortiz need to go over in this feud, and then Jericho loses to Orange, and then that, that sort of sets in motion that, oh, you know, we want our feud with these guys, but Jericho couldn't hold up his end of the deal. Oh, dissension. Okay. I think, yeah. I think Santana and Ortiz need it a little bit. I, I mean, with them, like right now, like they need something. They feel completely marginalized other than doing like these promos. And I was excited about the best friends. Well, feud, they're but it seems still, like... still great TV characters. They just oh, know, right. have, have been beaten a lot. Yeah, no, like they need to, like they need, they need to maybe join up with Eddie Kingston, as we saw in the next se net, the next segment. No real inner circle presence on this show. Like everybody kind of did their own thing. 
Well, Jericho's in commentary, so that's sort of, yeah. the, sort of the core around which it revolves. Yeah. But like Santana Ortiz didn't come out with Sammy or, you know, whatever. So it was, it was interesting. Uh, the Butcher and the Blade and the Lucha Brothers defeated Sonny Kiss and Joey Janela and Griff Garrison and Brian Pillman Jr. I'm pretty sure that Blade pinned Brian Pillman Jr. Yeah, I, I think it it wasn't after Toll Death. It was after a Sierra Meadow, I think. It was after a Fear Factor. After the match, Eddie Kingston cut a promo. And basically the point of this was that all five of them are going to be in the Casino Battle Royale, and one of them is winning. Eddie ruled. Eddie was great. There was a great thing at the end of it where uh, Phoenix jumped into the Butcher's arms, and I thought that that was tremendous. And this was another like really fun match, and I really want to see more of uh, Phoenix and Sunny Kiss together because I've, those two look like they probably have a real rocking match in them, and I'd like to see that in my version of AEW. <laughs> uh, we got a recap of Brody killing Cody and the post-match angle there. Dark Order came out with a coffin. Uh, we got Evil Uno on the mic. He says, we've been on a high since last Saturday. Brody bought six lawnmowers, and they're going to bid farewell to Cody. They open up the coffin. It's Preston Vance. He's got the shitty tattoo drawn on his neck. It's very funny. Uh, the casket is closed on the Nightmare family. We have buried the prince to make way for a new king. Brody comes out. He's got Anna J. He makes Tony come out to interview them. Tony Schiavone, of course. So Tony... I want you to look back at December. These men were being laughed at. I was at home in prison, which it's hard to be at home and in prison at the same time. It's called house and, arrest. That's true. He was on house arrest. Uh, he said he told Cody the beautiful piece of gold was coming home with him, but he gave Cody his belt back and talks about all the symbolism. But now no one can stand up to him. The open challenge is over. No more TV time for independent wrestlers. And Cody will never get the belt back. Uh, he introduces Anna J, the Queen Slayer. Uh, John Silver gets excited. He says Brody's the man. Brody knocks the shit out of him. He says, there's not a soul on earth that can touch us. We're the hottest act in wrestling. I'm the hottest champion in wrestling. And uh, Dustin and QT kind of stagger out. They're still, you know, in trouble from their earlier loss. Uh, it doesn't go well for them. Scorpio comes out. He does a little better. Uh, it comes down to him and Brody. Anna J gets involved and lets uh, Brody get um the advantage dark order beat him down and then matt cardona comes out to help and the baby faces ultimately cleared the ring this got no reaction from the fans in the building uh there, it was pretty sad there was radio silence for radio silence by always ready matt cardona <laughs> at the end that was a good one mike good job bud you, you see that's how you do a pun that that is how you do a pun yeah no like that that was like the thing that like i want what I was going to talk about and delete that I was not trying to step on your toes about was how like Scorpio sky comes out. Why is Scorpio coming out other than he had this title shot before Brody? There's like no link there. Dustin and QT makes whole sense. And it just felt really awkward. Like this pull part brawl felt really awkward to me. And then Matt Cardona came out. No one cares about Matt Cardona. And he thinks he's going to, he's on a per date deal and he wants to be signed full time to all elite wrestling. The crowd couldn't care. I, I mean, yeah, I know. I, uh, there's not. I don't think there is a super well justified reason for Scorpio to come out, but I kind of don't mind it. Just as like a wrestling thing, kind of just like, hey, here's a baby face we want to divert some attention to. You know, he hasn't been getting enough television time for the push that we're trying to line him up for. Uh, so hey, here's a reminder: he's a good guy. He's friends with Cody. He's going to come out and help, uh, and you know, maybe it builds to something else. If it goes nowhere, then yes, it's it's silly. It's like it's like the Dark Order attacking Matt Cardona on his first night in for no reason. Um, but yeah, you know, as as just a little pro wrestling foreshadowing. Hopefully, it's something. I guess the thing I don't like is you're going to do this eight man tag uh, on all out, right? It's like makes more sense to me to have done this eight man tag and then set up one of these people to challenge Brody at the at the pay per view. I'm confused about why they're doing matches on TV. Or, you know, they're like doing things that I think should be on the pay-per-view and they're either doing them on TV or just fucking not doing them. And it's like, I just don't understand some of the builds, I guess. It, it's something that I do kind of get like, okay, there was like the aspect of this kind of thing, like the way that 
Cody defended the TNT title is not going to be the case with Brody Lee, and it could be something where they're not that Brody is not going to like make this into a TV title. That Brody is going to make this into his own thing. So that'll be interesting. Yeah, but defended on the pay per view. I mean, it makes sense, and especially like where we're at a point of trying to figure out is all out supposed to be like this big pay-per-view or is it just another like show in the road dasha dasha it's not dasha come on aaron Jesus. get your shit together come on. dasha is with hongman <laughs> oh my god you, you see that, that that's a funny joke there ab that's funny again we are recording this friday this is not a late night thursday you know 1 a.m record no. oh i don't i really i don't enjoy my own jokes unless uh nate either groans or laughs if one of those things happens i'm happy so, uh, so that the whole entire likes thing was just you just trying just to irritate me then is what you're saying <laughs> uh i mean again i you really begged him for it mike <laughs> I didn't do it, and he saw, and so they used legs to do like that, and then, <laughs> and you said legs, Aaron, legs. Well, that was more like you're really making a joke out of it. Like, gosh, <laughs> gosh, indeed. Thank you for not swearing. Yes, thank I, you. I, I, I'm trying to watch my cussing in 2020. <laughs> so we're at the bar. Weird time to stop cussing, Mike. I mean, it's like <laughs> the worst time. <laughs> yeah, there were there were there were years with lower degrees of difficulty. <laughs> yeah. The Bucks are mad. They're like, of course you're at the bar. Why would you do this? Are you afraid to face us? Is it your insecurity? You didn't think you were good enough, but you always were. We just wanted to be your friend. Uh, and then they just, they go hardcore on this. You're an alcoholic thing. Uh, they say it's about time someone told you the truth. You're nothing but a drunk. That's Throws a real, drink at him. real good friend shit right there. Laid down the law. Yeah. Mad Jackson, underrated promo. He says, this is what you wanted, right? Well, we're done. You're out of the elite. And Hangman looks into a broken mirror. See, it's it's because the relationship is broken, and now Hangman is kind of a broken his, his man. His sense of self is broken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you do know I went to school for film criticism. Like I, I, I do get what imagery is. Well, I just want to make sure that all of the the EE podheads understand uh, okay. everything that's going on here. I mean, it was pretty subtle. So I wanted to make sure. Hey, if, if Martin Scorsese can put a fucking rat on a banister, then Tony Khan can break a, a mirror. Uh, Big Swole. Filthy is for cowards. Big Swole. Defeated. Britt Baker, Penelope Ford, and Rebel. Uh, Britt said before the match, if Swole wins, she can have any match she wants. Big Swole pinned Penelope. I just fucking hate when a babyface uh, wins a handicap match that was against them like that's just stupid i hate it i mean this match was just not good from the start to the end and you know i feel like set up to fail yeah it sucked dark order came out um anna j trying to get tay conti to join the dark order uh hat tip to mike spears tay conti the bone collector the absolutely bone collector, the queen slayer uh are just gonna violence dominate. is forever violence is forever now that's right. Uh, Tay Hug, they, they gave her, uh, it, really, it looked like Danny Jordan's burn book, to be honest, but if, <laughs> it, it was a, a Dark Order recruitment <laughs> package. And uh, Tay, now she hugged Anna J, which would lead you to believe that she's going to join, but she still had much more, um, much trepidation. more, yeah, trepidation than like what Hangman Page showed us. It was much more believable right. from Tay Conti that she wasn't exactly sure I thought what she played it really well. I, I agree. Really amused me. Yeah, and good. on Twitter, she's like, "I was just happy to see my friend," and it's just like I feel like yeah. that that was a kind of a cool route to go with this. I thought that this was well done. AJ forever. AJ but forever. Sammy Guevara defeated Matt Hardy in a tables match, uh, top rope suplex through the table. After the match, Orange Cassidy attacked Jericho. They brawled, setting up uh, their big match, the Mimosa Mayhem match. For all out. All right, that was Dynamite this week. If you uh, love, if you're a real EE pothead, you love Mike, Nate, Aaron, the boys, or one of the three of us, really doesn't matter. You can support us at patreon.com slash everything elite. We do lots of bonus audio. If you need some extra podcasts in your life, we got it for you this week. 
Mike did Mike's big indie weekend, recapping all the big indie wrestling from last weekend. Uh, every Wednesday, yeah, every Wednesday, we do light where Mike and I preview Dynamite, no matter what day it's going to be on. And uh, Nate hits us with all the classic blog content uh, to keep you caught up on that. We talk about dark. We talk about any other shoulder content that's uh, necessary. Next week, I think we're going to do the the All Out retrospective. We'll look back at last year's All Out. We have a Discord. You can join that. Uh, the Five Star Grand Prix kind of is in a little bit of a delay, but it's going to be back on September 5th, so I'll be back to doing daily audio on that. The Discord uh, is is pretty strong recommendation if uh, you want emojis of like Chris Dickinson standing at the top of a hill through some trees, <laughs> raising his arms. Uh, you know, if you've got Discord in the Nitro feature, then you can use that Chris Dickinson emoji on any other server. So it's, oh. it's good for that reason alone. I'm pretty proud of my emoji game and what I've set up is this. As Nate said, you get Chris Dickinson in Indianapolis. You get Eddie Kingston winking. I just added a new one of uh, Phoenix jumping into uh, the butcher's arms. And, of course, we have the uh, we have the Beaver Boys of Chili's. We, we, have, we have all kinds of great emo- emoticons, and we're, we're constantly doing this. And it's a, we uh, hang out during the shows for Dark, and we hang out during uh, Dynamites on there. A, a B and I do a live chat and we're coming up on a year of Patreon. Of course it we're coming up to the end of the month. So next week is going to be all out. So if you are someone that's going to hold out until September 1st, totally understand, but we'll be back that Saturday night right after uh, all out 2020 for an instant reaction show. So no better time than now to, to if you're not going to do this over the next few days, totally understand. I mean, with, with the way that Patreon operates, but we have that. We have stuff almost for a full year now. So you could go back through everything. And I think we're up to over 100 shows, so at least two a week. So check it out. Five bucks to get you everything we've ever done and uh, every piece of audio that uh, that we're going to do next month. That's right. I shouldn't have. I should have led off with the all-out in- instant uh, reaction show that'll be uh, coming up soon. This pay-per-view has kind of like crept on us in yeah. a lot of ways. Like, so that's something like this, but yeah, no, check it out. Maybe we'll have a guest. Who knows? Okay, next week on Dynamite, here's what we know Santana and Ortiz versus the best friends. Why is this happening on Dynamite? It just ha- it has to be part of the philosophy of the promotion, right? It ha- it's a television, it's television rights fees based promotion. They just must want to keep it, keep putting big matches on TV week after week. That's all I can conclude. Just do a six man. You know, and then you save the tag, the tag batch for the pay-per-view. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Chris Jericho versus Joey Janela. This is a great TV match. That's not a pay-per-view match. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I like that. Private Party and SCU versus the Young Bucks and Jurassic Express. The winners will face each other at All Out. I'm not really crazy about, you know, the winning team is going to explode at the, at the pay-per-view, but something else to build. John Moxley versus Mark Sterling. Uh, that's your episode of Dynamite next week. There's a lot of interesting things on that show. I'm going to be interested to see how Mark Sterling is there. And then Jericho versus Janela is a very interesting match to me. I don't know what kind of match it's going to be, but at the end of the day, it's going to be something. I think Jericho pretty well picks his opponent. So he must, right. must, he must like Joey. And maybe this means uh, Joey will be handled with a little more care sometime soon. We'll see. Yeah. All right. Uh, I didn't close that uh, hard sell with patreon.com slash everything elite. So I'm just going to say it one more time. (laughs) Um, If you want to uh, chat with us, uh, well, go to the Discord, join the Patreon and go to the Discord. But you can also tweet us at everything AEW. I'm at Aaron Like the Car. Nate is at Epitasis. Mike is at Fuji. Hey, ya. Subscribe to the podcast. Give us a five star rating. Give us a review. Go to patreon.com slash everything elite and make sure to check out. My bookie, who is presenting this episode of Everything Elite. So for Mike, for Nate, I'm Aaron. We'll see you next week. 